Jeez, thank, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to come to Regina. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's really nice. And it's nice to see uh, quite a few friendly and uh, familiar faces in the, in, in, in the audience. Is that, is that vodka? It's, 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 a bit, it's a bit early. It's a bit early, but thank you. Uh, um, <laughs> um, so, so I was asked to speak um, about, about clinical trials and radiation treatment. Um, let's see. So what, what I thought I'd cover, and you know, hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions after this is, after this is over, but what I thought we'd cover is a little bit about radiation treatment, um, and then focus on, on the whole clinical trials process. Um, what, what, how it's done, what clinical trials are all about. Talk about some current clinical trials that, that are ongoing with radiation. And then look a little bit to the future, say, well, where are we going? What's in the pipeline? What are the next type of studies that, that might be done with, with radiation treatment? So radiation treatment for, for, for prostate cancer is not new. And in fact, radium has been used to treat cancer for well over a century. Now, initially, when a new treatment comes along, um, it makes headlines. And what you see are some headlines from the New York Times over 100 years ago. And they sound fantastic. Cancer cured by radium. Radium is a cancer cure. Radium checks cancer in London. So there were reports coming in from all around the world of amazing cures by this new wonder treatment Radium. Um, so, for example, in the Middlesex Hospital, we read about 32 out of 68 patients who were inoperable, destined to die, suddenly Lazarus-like getting up out of, out of their beds and, and being able to go home. Now, not everybody was as enthused with these reports. And uh, there was a Dr. Doyen, who was a famous Paris surgeon at the time, and in 1914, he was not impressed by these newfangled radiation treatment guys. He, he said that uh, radium was a fraud. He said he figured that uh, most physicians who urge its use to cure cancer are charlatans. Um, he ch the, 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 the charges exploitations. And, there were ch and he challenged the, the radiotherapist to produce one single case of a real cancer cured. That was 1914. Well, 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 well fortunately, um, you know, his, 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 his assessment of, 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 of the data was, 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 was somewhat skewed. And, and, and in fact, radium and radiation treatment started being used quite extensively to treat prostate cancer 100 years ago. So prostate brachytherapy has been around for over 100 years. The first case of prostate brachytherapy uh, was, was in 1909. And, um, you know, the obviously techniques used were, were like somewhat primitive. Um, at the start, um, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the goal really was to get, get radium needles close to the prostate however possible. And one technique that was used was to stuff radium needles into the rectum, uh, some into the bladder, and keep them there for a period of time. Uh, this was something that was done by Hugh Hampton Young Daly, in daily seances for, for 20 to 30 fractions. So a lot of work. Um, a more interesting um, type of brachytherapy was developed a couple of years later where um, rad radon gas was left in the first inch of a, of a needle and it was called an emanation needle. So there was, there was radiation coming from the, the, the tip or the top one inch of, of this of this needle and it would be inserted right into the prostate and left there for, for a few hours to, 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 to give, give treatment. So radiation treatment of, of prostate cancer has a long history. Um, obviously it has evolved significantly since then. And um, radiation treatment is currently used quite a lot. In fact, about 60 to 70% of men who have prostate cancer 
um, will, will end, up, end up having radiation treatment of some type or another. There are, there are two main uses of radiation. One is to treat advanced cancer that has spread, and it's a really effective treatment for relief of pain and bone or for obstruction uh, or bleeding or, or blockage of spinal cord, major, major issues for men at the, at the end stage. But, but, but in particular, where it's mostly used is in a, is in a high dose to actually cure the cancer and ablate the, the cancer. So it's usually given um, in daily treatment over several weeks. And the reason being that this helps us to maximize the chance of cure. And by giving a little bit every day, healing occurs in the normal tissues. So it allows um, the, the, the amount of side effects to be minimized. However, uh, there's a challenge because the amount of radiation we need to cure a cancer um, is often close to the, what's called the tolerance dose of the surrounding tissues. So in order to get in enough radiation dose, we have to be very clever using you know, some new high-tech techniques to um, get enough radiation to the cancer but yet spare the normal tissues. The two most common types of radiation are external beam, where it's given from the outside, or brachytherapy, where the radiation is given from the inside. The outside radiation is usually given by, by a, mach a machine such as this, which is called a linear accelerator, and the, and the patient lies on the couch of the machine, and very high energy x-rays are shone and, 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 and uh, are, are used to treat the cancer. The machine moves around uh, from different, different, different uh, angles uh, targeting the cancer. So modern external beam radiation um, seems to have evolved into a lot of letters, okay? So the, so the sort of modern way of giving radiation treatment is using what's called intensity modulated radiotherapy, or IMRT. Uh, this, a newer form of this is called VMAT, and these techniques are becoming widely available and probably standard way of giving external beam treatment in Canada today. There are other ways, tomotherapy, cyberknife, and what's interesting, and which I'll touch on in a moment, is, is stereotactic body radiotherapy, SBRT, where very large doses of radiation can be given from the outside in, in a few fractions. And another uh, group of letters, IGRT, where image-guided radiotherapy, which is all part of the package. So modern treatment with radiation involves using one of these techniques to deliver the radiation, and at the same time, making sure that the target is in the crosshairs of the beams. Uh, using what's called image-guided radiotherapy. Regardless, the first step when someone is going to have radiation for the prostate or any part of the body is to, is to do a CAT scan. And on the CAT scan, we can see very nicely the internal anatomy of the patient. So from the CAT scan, we're able to see where the prostate is and where the neighboring organs that we need to avoid are, the bladder and the rectum in particular, and then come up with a way to deliver the radiation where we, where we wish. And the st current standard of care for delivering external beam radiation for prostate cancer is, is this thing called IMRT, or Intensity Modulated Radiation Therapy, where instead of just using flat beams as we did in the past, the, ble the beams are made up of, of, of um, little pencils of, of, of different intensity. And the gantry or the machine moves around as the patient lies on the couch and the intensity of the beam changes constantly um, enabling very precise delivery of, of radiation right into the prostate and minimizing the radiation elsewhere. So it, it, um, it, it is one of the more precise ways we have of targeting the prostate with, with high doses of radiation and is, is much better than, than previous methods using what we call 3D conformal techniques. Hand in hand with this is we need to make sure the prostate is in the right position every day. So a modern radiation machine also has an onboard imaging device which, which allows us to see every day while treatment is being delivered exactly where the prostate is. So the patient lies on the couch, this machine does a twirl around, 
identifies where the prostate is in that particular moment and will adjust the beams and adjust the position of the patient so that the, the prostate is lined up. Again, minimizing the chance of any collateral damage to, to, to other organs. One of the more, um, well, uh, 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 an interesting development in terms of technology is, is robotic radiation treatment. And a few centers in Canada have this device, which is called a cyber knife. So this is, in fact, a robot which, which delivers a radiation beam from, from this gun. And the patient lies on a couch, and, and this robotic machine moves around on its own, firing beams of x-rays at the prostate. Um, it's able to track the prostate in real time, so as the prostate moves, this, this robot chases after it. Now, it's not quite as if this robot chases the patient around the room, okay? He does, he does, he does lie on, 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 on a couch, but, and, 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 but the robot does move around, firing beams of x-rays at, at the prostate. It takes about 45 minutes to deliver a treatment. Uh, so there are a few of these in Canada, in Ontario, Ottawa, and, um, and Hamilton are, are two centers with, with, this, with this device. So how it compares with you know, standard or other ways of, of delivering treatment is yet to be determined. So as we said, a standard radical course of radiotherapy is given in daily treatments called fractions over about eight weeks, which is, which is good, but is a big investment in, in patient time. And we do end up giving a bit more radiation beyond the area of the prostate than is probably strictly necessary, even with these fancy robotic techniques. So the other way of giving radiation is, is, is my favorite way, which, which is, is instead of shooting from the outside, give the radiation right from the inside. So instead of shooting beams to the prostate from outside, which have to go through the bladder and the rectum and other organs, why not put the radiation right into the prostate? And there are two forms of brachytherapy available in Canada. The one that has been around the longest is, is a permanent seed implant where we put in little radioactive pellets into the prostate which slowly give off radiation over several months. The other way is what's called high dose rate brachytherapy where we put some, some straw-like needles into the prostate and they just stay there for a short period of time and we then put radiation into the straws. Seed brachytherapy, it's an outpatient procedure. This is my colleague, Dr. Loblaw, hard at work. We get the patient in. Um, he's under some type of anesthetic, either a general anesthetic where he's knocked out, or a spinal anesthetic where everything is frozen. And in a procedure that lasts about 30 minutes, we implant some radioactive pellets into the prostate. And here's an x-ray showing these little white seeds that are implanted in somebody's prostate. So a patient goes home, um, usually about two hours after the, the, the procedure is done. And uh, we see him back usually a month later, or the month we check, to make sure that the seeds are all well positioned, the radiation is going exactly where we want. We do a CAT scan, which will show us the prostate, and you may be able to make out these green seeds in the prostate. And we work out exactly where the dose is going. And you can see that it's usually very, very tight around the prostate. So it's a way of giving a big dose of radiation right into the prostate, which is very good for cancer that's confined just within the prostate. The other type of brachytherapy is called high dose rate brachytherapy. And again, it's done in the same room as the, as the seeds. The patient comes in, he's positioned in the same manner Here's Dr. Loblaw again saying a prayer, I think, before he, um, <laughs> before he starts the procedure. And, 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 and again, the patient has an ultrasound in the rectum, and we use this to insert these straws, these plastic straws, into the, into the prostate. 
The whole process is very interactive because in the operating room we have a whole team of radiation oncologists, physicists, radiation therapists to help us do this and to help us target the prostate. So these are the sort of pictures we see. We see the, uh, the this is an ultrasound of the prostate and these, this is um, a view from the front of the prostate. This is a view from the side and what you see on the side is the bladders up here, this red thing is the prostate, this is the urinary tube or urethra as it runs through and we have these needles that we've inserted, these plastic straws that we see in the ultrasound that we've inserted right in the prostate. Patient's asleep, he doesn't mind. So once we've got all the needles in place and we have a suitable plan, instead of individually placing seeds in the needle, we hook up these plastic straws to a radiation treatment machine, which under robotic control sends a very hot radioactive pellet one by one down these different needles. So it goes down the first needle and, and uh, might spend a minute in the first needle. It might go to one position for, ten se for, for two seconds, somewhere else for half a second, somewhere else for one second, and by varying exactly where it stops in each of these needles and for how long, we get the radiation dose that we want. So we end up giving, again, a very big dose of radiation very quickly to the prostate. So we give an ablative dose of radiation in about 10 or 15 minutes to the prostate. Once that is done, we, 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 we take everything out. We take all these needles out, wake up the patient. He goes to the recovery room, and the first thing he usually says is, when are we going to start? Okay. Um, so so it's, it's a nice procedure. It takes about an hour and a half usually in the operating room to do uh, patients home a couple of hours later. So why do we have these two different techniques? Won't one, why not just one? Well, well they're used slightly differently and, and the seeds are, are usually used for uh, sole treatment on their own for men who've got lower risk disease, so cancer just within the prostate. So low risk, lower Gleason score, um, uh, or, or, or maybe low intermediate. So for example, men who've got Gleason 7 cancer, but a low PSA. Whereas HDR, or high dose rate brachytherapy, is most commonly combined with external beam radiation to treat more aggressive cancers. So we usually use HDR to treat the Gleason 7, 8, 9, and 10 cancers, those that have got high PSA to start with or those that are locally advanced at diagnosis. Interestingly, the side effects are less with HDR, and the reason is that the radiation is given so quickly, whereas with the seeds, the side effects occur over the few months while the radiation is being given. And an advantage, HDR is cheaper because we hang on to the radioactive pellet. There's only one pellet. We use it again for the next guy, whereas when we're doing seed brachytherapy, um, the patient walks out with all our radioactive sources in his prostate, okay? Whereas we hang on to it with the, with the, with, with the HDR. So it works out cheaper for a, for, 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 for a program to have HDR than, than, than seeds. So where do all these treatments fit in? Like that's, so, so, so just to, rem to remind you, and this is, I'm sure, really common knowledge, is that, that not all prostate cancer is the same. Um, prostate cancer really is a spectrum from low risk cancers that um, you know are picked up incidentally and seem to grow very very slowly um, may never cause problems or cancers that are aggressive high grade even at diagnosis with a high propensity to spread so we try to put patients into risk groupings um, which which help us predict um, how this particular cancer is going to behave. We don't do this perfectly, but what we try to use are, 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 are factors such as PSA, um, and we divide it by, by less than 10, 10 to 20, or greater than 20, the stage of the cancer and the Gleason score, using a fairly simple matrix like this to separate men into those with low, intermediate, and, and high-risk disease, although our separation, as we, were, as we were just saying at the table, is far from perfect. But we use these classifications or categories to try to help us figure out 
for that particular patient what might be the best approach. And for low-risk patients, um, we can treat them with radiation, either brachytherapy on its own or external beam. When it becomes, as, as the cancer becomes a little bit more aggressive, we might start combining different treatments. And when we're dealing with high-risk cancer, we may end up giving external beam plus brachytherapy plus hormones as maybe the best way to, to treat these. And we will touch this again in a moment. But, you know, having said that, there's so much we don't know. Um, we don't know for sure that brachytherapy is the best way to deliver radiation. There's a lot of work at the moment looking at what's called hypofractionated radiation. So instead of giving the radiation over eight weeks, could we just give it in one week? Could we just get away with giving five fractions using some of these new fancy techniques and robots and things? Um, how do we combine radiation with other newer treatments that are coming online? Some of these new agents, some of these older agents like hormones, chemotherapy, but some of these newer agents, newer, newer drugs that are developed and just hitting the market. Can we use these in combination with radiation to improve results? And there's a huge amount of questions with, with technique and technical factors about how best to deliver the radiation. Can we combine it with, with radiation sensitizers? How about just treating part of the prostate with radiation? Focal treatment. How about hyperthermia? Is this something we can use as well? So because we've got so many questions, how do we answer them? Well, this is where, this is where research comes in. And, you know, we look on research as being basic research that a lot of people think about when they think about cancer research, uh, clinical research and, and translational research, which, which is sort of a link between these two things. Now, basic research is, um, is what a lot of us think about when we think about a cancer researcher. We think about somebody in a lab with a, with a, with a microscope or a mouse. And... Um, so, you know, the typical studies and typical things that people do would be investigate factors that cause cells to grow. So look and tease out the, the molecular mechanisms that cause cancer cells to grow and to interact with each other and to spread. Um, so often the researcher will end up growing these cancer cells in a, in a dish in, in the laboratory and then doing some experiments on these cancer cells. Like this is... This is a nice picture of a, of, of a cancer cell in, in a laboratory. It doesn't look particularly like anything you might see in a, in, in, in a human, but this is what we end up, this is what the, the basic researchers work with. So grow cancer cells in, in test tubes or in experimental animals. This is, this is, a, this is a, a very well used creature called a nude mouse that's, uh, that unfortunately um, for him can be, can be, can be used to grow, to implant some of these cancer cells, and they actually grow quite nicely under the skin of these, these nude mice, and a lot of, lot of basic research is done in, with, with, with these poor guys. And, and, you know, after a lot of work, the basic researcher is going to come up with these sort of diagrams, which, which, which um, for example, would, 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 be, would, would help us figure out, you know, some of the steps involved in regulating how cells grow and, and look at factors that influence them. And, and the next step then is to say, well, are there uh, ways when we can intervene with this cell cycle? Are there ways we can block various parts of it to treat cancer? So this is basic research, and that's, 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 that's what a lot of lab-based work involves, and, and, um, and the, the, the end product of, of a lot of lab research is, 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 is something like this, understanding and teasing out mechanisms of growth of cells and stimulation and, and trying to figure out ways to, to intervene here. Of course, while, 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 while mice and, and man have a lot in common, um, as, as, as Robbie Burns noticed um, some time back, uh, there are differences. And just because um, you know this, this cancer behaves in a particular way it in, uh, under the, the, the skin of the nude mouse doesn't mean it's going to behave the same way in, in someone's prostate or, 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 or in a human. Um, so this is where clinical research 
is required. And it really takes the research done in the lab and tries to make it relevant to, to what we're doing in the clinic. So clinical research is research with patient volunteers to help answer questions in the clinic. Okay, so, so substance X is great in the lab at stopping these cancers from growing. Um, it works great, it cures lots of mice. What about in the humans? Can we safely give it to, to the human? Um, can we, uh, and, and is it gonna work? So this is where we find out the pros and cons of new treatments. Um, we can also use it to compare different established treatments. So for example, um, should I have prostatectomy or radiation treatment for my prostate cancer? How many times have I heard that? And, and the way that, that um, we try to answer some of these questions is through, is through clinical trials. So clinical trials um, have three phases. So the first phase um, in, in, in a clinical trial when we've got a new compound or a new treatment is to say, well, is this safe in humans? Uh, sure, it's safe in mice, but you know, we don't really care about mice. Is it, is it safe in humans as well? So the phase one clinical trial is asking the question usually, is this new treatment or drug safe? And it will investigate, for example, how the body handles these different uh, substances. Uh, maybe it's the first time it's been used in humans. In radiation, an example would be, well, can we deliver radiation in a new manner? We talked about SBRT earlier, where we're giving treatment in a very condensed fashion. Is it safe to do that in, in the clinic? So this is an example of, 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 of a phase one clinical trial that, 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 that we did at Sunnybrook, asking a similar question. Is it safe to give an entire course of external beam radiation that normally takes eight weeks in, 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 in five treatments? So can we condense um, eight weeks worth of treatment? There are 40 treatments into five. Is that safe to do? Is it sensible? You can certainly see advantages in doing that uh, from a patient perspective. It, it would be much nicer just to have five instead of 40 treatments. Um, so what we did is we took a group of patients and we, 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 we um, treated them with, with five fractions, big dose per fraction, um, and monitored, monitored them very carefully for potential side effects. We used very modern, high-tech techniques to deliver and very precisely target the prostate, minimizing dose anywhere else. And, and the type of results we get from these studies would be, would be to say, yes, you know what, this is, this is safe. So we look at uh, their side effects, toxicity to the urinary or, 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 or gastrointestinal toxicity and, and, and show that, yeah, you know what, a lot of men tolerated this quite nicely. So that's really the sort of results you get from a phase one clinical trial. So we found that, you know, it's well tolerated, but we can't really say this is effective, this is an effective treatment and one that we should use further unless we do a bigger study. So the next step is to do a phase two clinical study. Well, we're asking the question, um, how effective is this treatment in a group of patients who have cancer? So these are larger studies than phase one clinical trials. And it also allows us to find out a little bit more about the side effects of treatment. And an example of this would be, um, would be our high dose rate brachytherapy study. So we saw what high dose rate brachytherapy was, and there seemed to be a lot of evidence that, that combining this with a short course of external beam was a very effective way of treating intermediate risk or higher risk prostate cancer. The problem is there was no uh, consensus on what the best treatment schedule might be. And usually multiple brachytherapy treatments were given. So we asked the question, can we get away with just giving one high dose rate brachytherapy treatment and a shorter course of external beam radiation. So we defined um, a group of patients that we wanted to test this on. So these were men who'd have what would be called intermediate risk disease, Gleason 7 cancer, PSA under 20. And we had a few other uh, parameters. None of them could have hormones. And obviously they had to agree 
to volunteer for this clinical trial. So the patients had two different types, two different schedules. One is where they were given two of these fractions of high dose rate brachytherapy a week apart and five weeks of external beam radiation, or just one big uh, fraction, higher dose of high dose rate brachytherapy and a three week course of external beam. And they were followed to see how, how effective both of these treatments were. And our hope was that the shorter course would be, would be every bit as good as the, as, the, as, the, as the longer course. So we looked at what happened to their PSA afterwards. And it plummeted. So these are patients who had the single, fifth, single fraction of high dose rate brachytherapy. First year, PSA plummeted way down and continued to drop. So that by, by five years, the average PSA was really low, 0.04. So suggesting that this is a very effective treatment for the cancer. And in fact, this was absolutely identical to what we saw when we, when we uh, give two of these smaller fractions of high dose rate brachytherapy. At five years, the disease-free survival was 95 to 98%, which again is very encouraging, showing that these treatments are, are, are very effective for, for, um, for men with, in this particular population group. And of course, the, the, the next step is to, is to broadcast these results and, and publish the results in, in, in the scientific journals so people can say, yes, you know what, these results look good and, and have them adopted by, by other centers. So, so what we did was we, we were able to come up with a standard way of giving this high dose rate brachytherapy. So single treatment with high dose of brachytherapy and a short course of external beam has become the standard way of treating men with intermediate risk prostate cancer in many parts of North America and indeed in, in many parts of, of Europe as well. Now, we still don't know uh, this is better than uh, high dose radiation alone or some of these newer robotic ways of giving external beam with, with, with SBRT. And another question is, well, well how about uh, giving high-dose brachytherapy on its own? Do we really need the external beam as well? Because, because others have published really good results with high-dose rate brachytherapy on its own without the external beam. So this is uh, from a colleague of mine, Jeff Demanis, and, and he showed that the disease-free survival uh, uh, after high dose rate brachytherapy on its own was 97%. So really high results with high dose rate brachytherapy on its own. However, the high dose rate brachytherapy was given not in one or two treatments, but involved several treatments, uh, usually four or six treatments, which is not that convenient. So what we would really like to do next would be to see if we can get the same really good results with high dose rate brachytherapy on its own without external beam radiation given in just one or two uh, treatments. And, and this is a, a phase two, what's called a randomized phase two clinical trial that we've put together and we are hoping to get underway fairly shortly at, at, in, in Toronto. We're also looking at a lot of other areas. We're, we're, we're looking at using some advanced imaging. We treat the whole prostate with high dose rate brachytherapy. Maybe we could just target selectively areas of cancer. So another area of research we're working on is uh, combining the ultrasound during the brachytherapy procedure with MRI to help us identify areas of cancer. So that instead of having to treat the whole prostate, maybe we could just focally ablate or get rid of uh, the areas of cancer that we see and, and identify an MRI. So what we're doing is we're taking special MRIs to help us identify where the cancer is. Take these into the operating room and use these uh, with, combined with the ultrasound to just treat part of the prostate. So we have an ongoing clinical trial in this setting for men who've got recurrence after external beam. And we're just treating areas of cancer within the prostate. So I've shown you lots of different ways 
of treating prostate cancer with radiation. You can give it from the outside with all sorts of, all sorts of letters, IGRT, EPRT, IMRT, v, you name it, different types of brachytherapy. How is the poor patient going to sort this out? And how is anyone supposed to, to, to make sense out of these and, 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 um, and select? Because, you know, I see so many patients and, you know, they go and they see their doctor and the doctor says, oh, yes, Mr. Smith, you've got a cancer in the prostate. You could have watchful waiting, you can have hormones, you can have surgery, you can have robotic surgery, you can have brachytherapy, you can have hydrosia brachytherapy, you can have IMRT, you can, and it goes on. You could have HIFU, you could have, and it goes on and on. And, and, and that's not all that helpful, actually. Um, uh, I, 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 like I'm sure, I'm sure you've, you've seen this and you've seen, you've seen patients, and I get guys, you know, because, because like we do, you know, we do, we do encourage men to take ownership of the decision, become informed, but, 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 you know, they end up being informed of 20 different ways of, of doing something, and it's very difficult to weigh these up. Like, how do you advise the patient? How do you, how do you say, well, you know, this one, maybe you, should, maybe you shouldn't really have, you know, uh, whatever it is, uh, colonic irrigation to treat your advanced prostate cancer. Maybe, 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 maybe I'd suggest something different. So, so, so it would be nice to be able to put some science to this. So, so, and it would be really nice to have good scientific data that actually compares the different treatments. So rather than one person saying, should all have surgery, someone else saying, should all have brachytherapy, someone else saying, should all have IMRT or SBRT or robotic cyber, whatever. Let's just look at all the data. Unfortunately, we don't have good data to look at, and this is one of the, one of the problems. There have been attempts to do this, and there have been attempts to try to take all of the published information about outcomes with, with, with different types of treatment and, and compare them. Now, from a purely scientific point of view, this is really difficult. But, but this was a good effort, and this was led by Peter Grimm, who's, uh, who's in Seattle. And what he did was he put together uh, an international group of, of prostate cancer experts, including radiation oncologists, uh, surgeons, pathologists, um, so, so well-known international experts. So they got together and, and they said, well, you know, this is, this is a bit of a mess. Let's try to figure out what, what, how these different treatments compare. So they wanted, so they set a, about analyzing all of the published results um, on, on, on prostate cancer outcome. So they wanted, first of all, um, to have minimum numbers of patients reported. They had some criteria for, 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 for which studies would be included. Um, and and uh, they all agreed, yeah, this is, this is what we want. So they then published their results um, in this sort of format. So they wanted patients to be categorized by risk groups. So it's no point comparing low-risk patients treated with surgery with high-risk patients who've had external beam and saying, oh, the surgical patients did better. Of course they do better. They've got a, it's a different patient group. So they wanted studies that broke down the patient populations by risk groups. So you could look at all the studies that, that reported outcome for low-risk prostate cancer treated by different modality. And, and they present them in, 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 a, in a kind of a nice way. So, they, so each of these uh, color spots represent a different reported study, clinical trial in the literature. And the number refers to that particular study in the, in, in the appendix. But, so, for example, number six, for example, would be uh, a report looking at surgery, so radical prostatectomy, and this would report that for low-risk patients in this particular clinical trial, at 10 years, the disease-free survival was about 65%. Okay? And uh, pick another one. So this, this green would be, what, external beam, and it would show that 
at this, in this particular clinical trial, at five years, the disease-free survival was 80%. And, and these circles are statistically generated um, ovals around the outcomes. So not perfect, it's not randomized, but it's, it's probably as good as we have, and it's a good way of summarizing what's currently in the literature. So, so these purple dots are patients treated with brachytherapy. And, and, and certainly there's a perception that the brachytherapy patients are certainly doing well. So for example, number 24 here would be 12 year disease free survival of well over 95% in patients treated with brachytherapy. So certainly looking at this, you might say, well, um, if I'm having, if I've got low risk prostate cancer and I want to treat it, uh, certainly brachytherapy looks like a pretty good way of doing this in terms of, of long-term outcome. Same thing for men with intermediate risk disease. So remember, these are patients who've got Gleason 7 cancers, PSA under 20, a bit more advanced. Um, same procedure. So, so again, these green dots are external beam, and this, this, this study just reported a 40% disease-free survival at eight years for these patients, which like, isn't very good. So you'd say, well, Maybe external beam radiation on its own isn't, isn't ideal. The red, again, would be surgery. But look what's up on the top. It's these, it's these brachytherapy dots. And, and um, so just to explain, so this, the, the colors don't, don't, don't project all that well, but, but, but the, these, these purple ones refer to um, external beam, sorry, seeds alone. Uh, these ones are seeds plus external beam, and this yellow, these yellow dots here are high dose rate brachytherapy. And again, you see, they all do, do pretty good. High risk patients, same thing. Um, again, we can look at all treatments because all reported treatments were included in the, in, in the paper. Um, and again, there's certainly a perception that these purple and blue and yellow dots, which are um, external beam plus seeds or external beam plus seeds and hormones or HDR do certainly as well as, as, as the other treatments. So, so, you know, we look at this and we say, well, well, this is really interesting. It certainly suggests that patients uh, treated with uh, if we're treating patients with, 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 with radiation, brachytherapy should certainly be part of the equation. Um, for high-risk patients, the best reported results come from series which use external beam, seeds, or HDR, and hormones. But of course, these are all just phase two studies, and strictly speaking, we can't scientifically compare these, even though it's very suggestive. So this comes us to phase three clinical trials, where we try to compare outcomes of different approaches in a scientifically rigorous fashion. Now, this is the most difficult of all clinical research to do, but it's the most informative because it will tell us once and for all which treatment is better. It's, um, so we may compare two new treatments, or we oft, more often we compare one treatment uh, a new treatment with, a, with an older standard treatment. So patients are randomized to two or more different treatment arms. So for example, they could be randomized to radical prostatectomy or brachytherapy and follow them up and see, see well, is one really better than the other? Because each person entering into the clinical trial would have an equal chance of getting either, either arm. But these studies are, are difficult to do. They involve large numbers of patients um, and long follow-up, and they're really expensive to, to undertake. The questions asked are usually the difficult ones. And despite great efforts and funding being available and the question being scientifically important, sometimes they just fail to accrue. And two examples of this recently would be, would be the START clinical trial and the SPIRIT clinical trial. So these are, these are phase three randomized clinical trials 
that started, they were led by Canadian investigators, Juanita Crook for Start in particular, and, and Laurie Cotts for Spirit, and the, 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 the goal really to, to find out once and for all um, which of two treatment strategies might be better. So Start was, um, was a comparison of active surveillance with immediate treatment. So men with low risk prostate cancer, they'd be told, you know what, we're not sure how best to treat you, uh, which is true. Uh, active surveillance seems a very good option, but upfront treatment is also a good option. So let's randomize to, to either arm. And in 10 years, we'll know if it's safe or better to do one approach versus another. But of course, from a, a scientific perspective, that's, that's a very good question to ask. But from a patient perspective, it's not as attractive an option because uh, patients do have problems with this concept of being randomized and letting the coin or the computer decide which treatment they're going to have. Another example was the, was the SPIRIT clinical trial. And this was a study comparing radical prostatectomy with, with brachytherapy. This was started over 10 years ago. And if it had been successful, we would now have really high level evidence that one of these approaches was better than the other. But again, it's a very difficult sell for patients, even though it might be scientifically um, uh, very valid to ask patients, would you be randomized to either prostatectomy or brachytherapy, especially when they're told about the different side effects and how much is involved with each, each approach. So, so we don't actually know these answers. But we do have many successful phase three randomized trials led by Canadians that have changed practice. Here's a couple of really important ones. But just to show how long this takes, this is a study performed by Dr. Porig Ward, who's at Princess Margaret Hospital. He asked the question, for men who've got high-risk prostate cancer, uh, should we use radiation treatment as well as hormones? Now, he first asked this question 20 years ago, because 20 years ago, we didn't know the answer. And he started doing this clinical trial 20 years ago, and only last year, uh, the results were finally ready. So, 20 years to get the answer. So long process, long time, a lot of effort, a lot of cost to, to find out that in fact radiation is a good thing. So, so this is the results of the clinical trial. So the top curve are patients who had radiation and hormones at the start with locally advanced prostate cancer. And you can see that about 90% um, about of them are alive at seven years. Whereas if they were, did not have the radiation and were just were treated with hormones alone, only 70%, uh, uh, the number, 79% of them were, were alive at seven years. So the addition of radiation at the start uh, improved survival. But it took like 20 years of work to, to get these curves. Um, so the study has shown and changed practice that even old school radiation treatment can improve survival and we shouldn't manage patients with hormones alone who've got high risk disease. Another really important question uh, was in men who develop a rising PSA after initial treatment and we're going to use hormone treatment, should we use the hormones continuously or intermittently, off and on? Certainly using it intermittently has, has advantages because the patient will only be on hormone treatment for a shorter period of time. Eight months at a stretch and then off, and then if the PSA starts rising again and reaches a trigger, we start again with the, with the hormones. There was some laboratory-based evidence that this would be a good strategy, but we didn't know if it was safe to do in, in humans. So Dr. Crook again and Dr. Klotz uh, undertook a randomized clinical trial comparing these two different approaches published just last month in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what it showed, no difference. So whether men had, were treated with continuous hormones or intermittent hormones, there was no difference in their chance of survival subsequently. So this has caused a lot of us to use intermittent hormones with, with, some, with, some, uh, with some safety as opposed to, as opposed to our previous uh, continu continuous hormones. Now, these big phase three randomized clinical trials 
require a big organization to do. The biggest organization for radiation clinical trials is the Radiation and Therapy Oncology Group, the RTOG. This is a, um, a US-based group. It has funding from the National Institute of Health. Uh, this is the website. And uh, they actually have quite nice information about, uh, for, for, for lay, uh, for, for patients, about what sort of clinical trials are ongoing. The, the mandate of the RTOG is to explore new directions in radiation therapy, do quality of life research, and translational research. So to take a lot of these laboratory basic science questions and test them out in the clinic. And there are a number of RTOG studies currently open. Um, we're looking at different strategies for patients with low risk disease. Can we do hypofractionated external beam? Um, should we add hormone treatment to high dose radiation for men with intermediate risk disease? Should we radiate the pelvis? Should we add in some new agents uh, as well as radiation when we're treating these, the, these patients? And there are a number of clinical trials looking at different strategies for uh, men who have high risk cancer or recurrent disease. This last one is kind of interesting because it uses a type of radiation called systemic radiation. So instead of external beam or brachytherapy, what if you inject uh, a radioactive substance like chemotherapy? And if this radioactive substance can go through the body and selectively target the cancer. So sumerium is bound to um, a substance that goes to areas of bone metastasis. So supposing we give this early on, could this actually treat and seek out very early cancer in the bone? So that's the concept, and that's the question that's being asked here. So we just maybe move on. So, so we talked about um, that radiation can also be used for patients with metastatic disease. It's used for relief of pain, uh, for pain for patients who've got cancer in bone. But as in an RTOG study, one question is, could we use early radiation to bone to prevent the subdevelopment of, of prostate cancer in bone? Now, this is what we don't want to see. Okay? This is what a bone scan looks like of somebody who has metastatic prostate cancer. So all of these black dots okay, represent areas of cancer in, in bone. More specifically, they, they indicate area that the injected substance goes to. And in this situation, we use something called technetium 99N. That's the radio pharmaceutical that goes to these spots and stays there. So when we take uh, an image with what's called a gamma camera, we can see these hot areas which represent cancer. So for this particular patient, well, what we would do is his, his biggest problem is from his, is from his leg. You can see the, 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 the thigh here is very black. He was having in here. So we were able to give a single treat with external beam. And that got fabulous pain relief from, from that area. But what about the rest? What if we were able to treat that with radiation as well? So what if we were able to, 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 to instead of just image these spots, actually give a sub that would go to these spots phone and deliver a big dose of radiation just to those spots. Wouldn't that be a nice way to, to treat this? So this is something that we've been doing for a while. Now the problem is that agents that have been available up to now, uh, strontium-89, sumerium, because in addition, they do go to these areas of the bone. They do. And the radiation dose there. But the big problem is that they spread the radiation too far. And they end up also giving a big dose of radiation to the bone marrow, which is a problem because the patient can then end up with marrow failure. I've seen this happen. So safety is a problem with these old agents. 